So finding yourself where you have landed this morning. Maybe exactly where and how you planned, and maybe not. Inviting yourself into this moment. And take a long, slow breath in through your nose. Open your mouth and sigh. If it feels good, shrug the shoulders up, back, and down, away from the ears. Make any movements in the jaw and the face. Feel the texture underneath your hands, whether it's the back of your hands or the palms of your hands. Feel the quality of what is beneath you. Notice that whether you are sitting on pillows or blocks or the floor, that you can sense the ground there. You can sense your ability to rest the holding, to take a pause in the doing and allow the ground to hold you here as your seat spreads out side to side, maybe allowing the chest to rise and fall more freely, the shoulders to relax more delicately, the breath perhaps to flow with more awareness. Let's take an inhale together. As you exhale, gather your hands together in front of your heart, palm touching palm or hand on top of hand on your chest. If you would rather keep grounding down through the hands on the thighs, please, please do so. I invite you to chant the sound of Om with me three times. Finding the quality of your breath this morning, the sound that you make, noticing how it changes from first to second to third. Notice the quality of oming with your microphone off. Does it allow you freedom to listen to your voice? Does it invoke sensation of how you would like it to be compared to how it is this morning? Three times if you choose, inhaling together. Oh.
Release your left hand to your left thigh. Curl your first finger into your thumb. A Gyana Mudra, a wisdom seal. Everything's okay. Palm up, unless palm down. Hooking over the kneecap invites you to ground more today. Right palm up in front of your face. First two fingers down into your palm or between your eyebrows. Either way, ring finger to the left nostril, thumb to the right nostril. Broaden the collarbones. Relax the elbow down. Sit here and now as you breathe in and as you breathe out. Now close the right nostril with the thumb and inhale left for three, two, one. Close left, exhale right. Three, two, one. Inhale right. Three, two, one. Close right, exhale left. That's one round of Nadi Shodam. Inhale left, two, one. Close left, exhale right. Three, two, one. Inhale right. Three, two, one. Close right, exhale left. That's a shorter round of Nadi Shodan, a longer round. I mean. So now breathe that horseshoe pattern, unless it brings anxiety into your moment. We don't need more of that. This breath could be a way that you are in control for a moment. Close this nostril and then open this nostril. Nadi Shodana might balance right and left side of your sinuses. Some say right and left side of other things, the body, the brain, sun and moon, doing and relaxing. It is allowing you to draw awareness to what it's like to have something constricted and something open. It may invite something to flush or flood after it is opened and released. Take a break to blow your nose if you need to. Check in with tension that might creep into the jaw, the shoulders, the thighs, and invite yourself to sink down into the floor as you move through one more complete round of Nadi Shodana. Inhaling left and then exhaling right. Inhaling right, exhaling left. When you arrive at that exhale through the left, relax the right hand down. And gently blink your eyes open. Release the seat you've taken. Maybe you stretch the legs long or just move the knees a little. And then gently moving the props you brought to your practice out to the side. Climb into a heart bench. So heart bench in the studio, we practice with two blocks or two blocks and a blanket. So you could have one block on the tall height, one block on the medium. This creates a slope. This creates a slope so the head is higher than the heart. And if today you don't have yoga blocks with you, then find two beach towels or blankets. You could even use three depending on how, how much support or height you would like in your heart bench. And then you roll those blankets up into a tube. You place that tube onto your mat. And now you still need to have your head higher than your heart. So you could bring a pillow from your bed. I like a soft pillow from my bed for this because then I have the option to fold it in half if today it's not higher. So snuggling up, coming in with the knees bent, making sure the jaw can relax with whatever version of head support you have here. Maybe the supports or the blocks feel a little pokey. Can you relax that area around it and let them support you? Some days the answer is yes, and some days the answer is no thank you. If the body says no thank you, listen to it because we're asking it to relax and place something more over the blocks or the blanket so that the edges that are too much are softened. Legs can be long here, toes just relaxed. Feet can be as wide as the mat with the knees knocked in. 
You can also allow the knees to gently drop out to the side with the feet touching. If you choose this knees out to the side option, know that you can bring blocks or your sneakers or a blanket or cushions under your thighs so that all these wonderful long muscles in your legs relax. We invite the muscles to relax here in heart bench so that the connective tissue, the fascia, the yin tissue stretches out. I'm gonna come up to the screen for a moment and mute folks that have come off mute. Invite yourself to breathe in fully and deeply. Exhale, sigh. As I teach today, I will demonstrate the shape and some options, and then I will come up to read from the first chapter of Pema Chodron's book, Living Beautifully with Uncertainty and Change. So know that I am coming up out of the shape, so if something feels wrong or confusing, you can wave to me and point. You can certainly come off mute and ask questions today. In poses where you are reclining back, you may enjoy having something over your forehead or over your eyes. You might explore the quality of having a scarf or a sheet over you. It doesn't have to be a weighted blanket to kind of remind the body of its ability to receive, to receive safety and comfort through covers. The first chapter is called The Fundamental Ambiguity on being human, of Being Human. And it starts off with a quote from Shunryo Suzuki Roshi. Life, life is like stepping into a boat that is about to sail out to sea and sink. We read these words or hear these words and we can think, oh no, my boat is going to sink. What if my boat is going to sink because I only need it to take me so far and then I will swim or I will float or I will find the shore, a raft? It can be useful to notice the first thought that we have and then lovingly notice the second one. The first one is so often a trigger, a conditioning. The second one is often a truer glimpse into the uniqueness of how smart and kind we are. As human beings, Pema writes, we share a tendency to scramble for certainty whenever we realize that everything around us is in flux. In difficult times, the stress of trying to find solid ground Something predictable and safe to stand on seems to intensify. But in truth, the very nature of our existence is forever in flux. Everything keeps changing, whether we're aware of it or not. What a predicament. We seem doomed to suffer simply because we have a deep-seated fear of how things really are. Our attempts to find lasting pleasure, lasting security, are at odds with the fact that we're part of a dynamic system in which everything and everyone is in process. I've got that part underlined. We are part of a dynamic system in which everything and everyone is in process. So this is where we find ourselves, right in the middle of a dilemma. And it leaves us with some provocative questions. How can we live wholeheartedly in the face of impermanence? knowing that one day we're going to die? What is it like to realize we can never completely and finally get it together? Is it possible to increase our tolerance for instability and change? How can we make friends with unpredictability, unpredictability and uncertainty and embrace them as vehicles to transform our lives? 
the Buddha called impermanence one of the three distinguishing marks of our existence, this gift of being human and alive, an incontrovertible fact of life. But it's something we seem to resist pretty strongly. We think that if only we did this or didn't do that, somehow we would achieve a secure, dependable, controllable life. How disappointed we are when things don't work out quite the way we planned. She continues, not long ago, I read an interview with the war correspondent Chris Hedges in which he used a phrase that seemed like a perfect description of our situation, the moral ambiguity of human existence. This refers, I think she says, to an essential choice that confronts us all, whether to cling to the false security of our fixed ideas and tribal views, even though they bring us only momentary satisfaction, or to overcome our fear and make the leap to living an authentic life. That phrase, the moral ambiguity of human existence, resonated strongly with me, she says, because it's what I've been exploring for years. How, how can we relax and have a genuine, passionate relationship with the fundamental uncertainty and groundlessness of being human? My first teacher, she goes on, Chogyam Trumpa, used to talk about the fundamental, fundamental anxiety of being human. This anxiety or uneasiness in the face of impermanence isn't something that afflicts just a few of us. It's an all-pervasive state that human beings share. But rather, be, rather than being disheartened by the ambiguity, the uncertainty of life, what if we accepted it and relaxed into it? What if we said, yes, this is the way it is? This is what it means to be human. And she says, and decided to sit down and enjoy the ride. <laughs> Up until now, we've been so busy. We've been so successful at being so busy that we haven't contemplated this uncertainty. We've had so many things that we were sure we had control of. We were able to do a lot. There is a quality of this pandemic and this quarantine of slamming on the brakes into a stillness that we may not have wanted. Add to that all the well-meaning people who are inviting us to write a novel, learn a language, when it seems taking a shower and waking up every day is a challenge. So how... How do we welcome this sensation right now? Feel what is underneath your head. And then you know your jaw can soften, yeah? Feel either the big opening across the chest or the groins. Whether you enjoy it or don't enjoy it, could you soften with the experience of it? Please, friends, any time a shape brings about a nervy, um, tight, painful sensation that makes you hold your breath, please change the shape. This is, not, this is not an exercise in suffering. This is an opportunity to see where and how we hold to ideas of how it should be, to hopes of how it feels, and instead be with what is right now, right here. So to that end, let's breathe in through the nose. Open the mouth and sigh. <sighs> if the arms are far away from the body, draw them in. Turn the palms down, feel what is underneath you. And either pressing into the mat or using the hands to lift the legs, do start to draw the knees up if they are bent out to the side or the legs are long. Have the knees bent. Have the feet on the floor and pause. This changes where the body is pressing into everything. So feel that change. Notice if you like it or don't like it. And then be with the sensation. There is nothing wrong with not liking it. There is nothing wrong with liking it. There is this, though, this moment, this breath in. And this breath out. <sighs> Press into the hands, the elbows, lift the face, look to your knees, and you decide, roll over to your right and come up to sit. 
or press yourself up. Either way, finding a seat, stretching the legs out a little further, and then softening the belly towards the thighs, the shoulders towards the knees, and the chin to the chest. <sighs> I invite stillness to kind of hang in this shape. And if you would love to move the neck or the head side to side, invite yourself to go slowly, doing something with the inhale, something different with the exhale, small movements, maybe one more time with an inhale move. And maybe an exhale move. So your feet are on the ground. Your seat is on the ground. Put your hands on the ground. Use your arms to roll the low back behind you, then the middle back, then the shoulders. Lift the face. Take the shoulders up, back, and down. Bend your knees. Move over to the side so you can take whatever was behind you and off to the side. Come to sit back further on your practice space so your legs can be long now. I'm gonna invite you to fold forward into a shape we call caterpillar. So caterpillar is the legs long. It might be a little bend in the knees with the blanket or socks underneath. And then you draw the chin down, round the shoulders down and lean forward and down. Some days the hamstrings or the back is really tight. You might find it useful to perch on the edge of a seat to feel more movement forward, but there's nothing to win. There's nothing better about having the torso further down. Instead, find a version of the shape that allows your shoulders and your head to relax. So that might be bringing books or blocks in front of you to rest your elbows, your arms, and put your head there. Maybe you don't have yoga blocks, but maybe you have maybe you have a bench that you can use. You could also have a chair instead of a bench. I love practicing this caterpillar shape with something really close up. Sometimes when you use a chair or a bench in this way, you feel perhaps more sure of the stability of the platform which might invite more relaxing in the muscles. So you feel an opening across the low back, maybe across the outer hips. Maybe you feel it in the back of your thighs or the back of your calves, your shins. Wiggle your toes and invite your feet to relax. The space in between the toes, the arches of the feet. Maybe you take something gently over your shoulders or around your low back to feel warm, to feel cared for, to feel supported. So the Buddha gave instructions, many instructions, on how to sit down and enjoy this ride of being human. Among these instructions are what are known in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition as the three vows or the three commitments. There are three methods for embracing the chaotic, unstable, dynamic, challenging nature of our situation as a path to awakening. These are not three things to achieve, right in concrete and be done with. These are three methods. A method is something you use very often. The first of the commitments is traditionally called the Prati Moksha Vow. It's the foundation for personal liberation. This is a commitment to doing our best not to cause harms with our, harm with our actions or words or thoughts. A commitment to being good to each other. It's a commitment to being good to you. Providing a structure within from which we can work with our thoughts and emotions. To refrain from speaking or acting out of confusion. The next step towards being comfortable with groundlessness is a commitment to helping others. Traditionally called the Bodhisattva vow. It's a commitment to dedicate our lives to keeping our hearts and minds open. To nurturing our compassion with the longing to ease the suffering of the world. 
the last of the three commitments traditionally known as the Samaya vow, is a resolve to embrace the world just as it is without bias. It's a commitment to see everything we encounter, the good and bad, the painful, the pleasant, as a manifestation of awakened energy. It's a commitment to see anything and everything as a means by which we can awaken further. What does that fundamental ambiguity of being human mean in terms of day-to-day -day life? Above all, Pema says, it means understanding that everything changes. Shantideva, an 8th century Buddhist master, wrote in the way of the Bodhisattva, he wrote, all that I possess and use is like a fleeting vision of a dream. It fades into the realms of memory and fading will be seen no more. Whether we're conscious of it or not, the ground is always shifting. Nothing lasts, including us. There are probably very few people who at any given time are consumed with the fully, with the idea that I'm going to die, but there is plenty of evidence that this thought, this fear haunts us constantly. I too am a brief and passing thing, observed Shantideva. So what does it feel like to be human in this ambiguous, groundless state? For one thing, we grab at pleasure and try to avoid pain. But despite our efforts, we're always alternating between the two. Under the illusion that experiencing constant security and well-being is the ideal state, we do all sorts of things to try and achieve it. Eat, drink, drug, work too hard, spend hours online. And somehow we never quite achieve the state of unwavering satisfaction that we're seeking. At times we feel good. Physically nothing hurts us, mentally is all well. And then it changes and we're hit with physical pain or mental anguish. Emma says, I imagine it would even be possible to chart how pleasure and pain alternate in our lives, hour by hour, day after day, year in, year out, first one and then the other. But it's not impermanence per se or even knowing we're going to die that's the cause of our suffering. Hmm. It's our resistance to the fundamental uncertainty of our situation. Our discomfort arises from our effort to put ground under our feet to realize our dream of constant okayness. When we resist change, it's called suffering. But when we completely let go and not struggle against it, when we can embrace the groundlessness of our situation and relax into its dynamic quality, that's called enlightenment, awakening to our true nature, to our fundamental goodness. Another word for this is freedom. Freedom from struggling against the fundamental ambiguity of being human. Maybe these days you're doing all the things you love. Maybe these days you're doing things you never imagined doing and you don't love it. It seems very likely to me that throughout your day there are things that you do that you don't choose or perhaps enjoy so much. Allowing yourself to feel those feelings, sensations, the feeling of wanting to escape, the feeling of wanting it to be over, the feeling of wanting certainty and groundedness. Allowing yourself to feel the desire and aversion can change your experience of the moment. Can move you to a place where you're free of suffering for a moment. Let's breathe in together here and breathe out. Begin to draw your elbows back. Feel your hands on the ground. Roll up from the bottom to the top. Maybe put your hands on your legs or on any props you've used and give the shoulders a shrug. Maybe a little movement of the knees side to side. So we invite the muscles to soften. We stretch the connective tissue. That stretching can feel kind of tight and creaky. So it might, a little movement in between sides might feel good. Moving into the shoulders now, I'd like to invite you to practice praying mantis. So I'll show a couple different versions. You can practice it with blocks as wide as your shoulders. I figure out how wide my shoulders are on any given day by coming to hands and knees and having my middle finger line up with the middle of my block. 
So it's not going to be child's pose, sitting back on the heels. It's going to be hips high and a curve in the low back. And draw your elbows to the blocks, hands in front of you or hands behind you. Sink the upper arms down towards parallel with the top of the blocks. Feel a big opening in the chest, a lot of pressure in the top of the shoulders, a curve in the low back, and feel the legs on the ground. You might tuck the toes, you might cross the ankles, but feel the legs can hold you here. There's a quality of kind of lifting your bottom up and almost pressing it back a little to invite the chest to soften down. If you didn't bring blocks into quarantine, who knew? Practicing this with a chair or a bench is really lovely. So you would have your elbows up on the bench. You could practice this at your couch or your chair. And then you could have the arms forward, and then you just walk the knees back until the upper arm bones come down. You may, depending on how long your upper arm bones are, be able to bring the chin to the chest to rest the head in between the arms. Or you may have a different length in your upper arm bones and you may end up resting your forehead on the couch. See if this can be primarily about opening the front of the chest, compressing the top of the shoulders and being okay with that. Ugh. Hands behind you, hands in front of you. Feel what is on the ground. Soften the face, soften the jaw. What do you say to yourself when something's uncomfortable in yin yoga? Do you say, oh, this is uncomfortable. My fascia is stretching, which is good for my, the rest of my day. Or do you critique something about yourself or what you've done or haven't done. Freedom from suffering starts with noticing your sensation, feeling your feelings, hearing your thoughts, and then doing what makes sense to avoid suffering. So that could be kind words to yourself about your effort and your experience. It could be taking awareness from the thought into what is physically happening in the body. How do you reset that pathway that may have been forged to being critical and judgmental? How do you turn that towards the kindness and wisdom, wisdom that you know at your core? I went on to say what the fundamental amb ambiguity of being human points to is that as much as we want to, we can never say this is the only true way, this is how it is, end of discussion. Chris Hedges talked about the pain, that pain, the pain that ensues when a group or religion insists that its view is the one true view. As individuals, we too have plenty of fundamentalist tendencies. We use them to comfort ourselves. We grab on to a position or belief as a way of neatly explaining reality, unwilling to tolerate uncertainty and discomfort of staying open to other possibilities. We cling to that position as our personal platform and we can become very dogmatic about it. Just a few more breaths here. If you're clenching your jaw, see if it can relax. If you feel a tightness holding across the upper arms or the thighs, see if the exhale can relax that. And if not, then and move gently back into a child's pose. Emma says, when I first came to Gampopo Alley, I thought of myself as likable, flexible, open-hearted, open-minded person. Part of that true, but another part wasn't. For one thing, I was a terrible director, she said. The other residents felt disempowered by me. They pointed out my shortcomings, but I couldn't hear what they were saying because my fixed identity was so strong. Every time new people came to live at the Abbey, I got the same kind of feedback, but I still didn't hear it. This went on for a few years, then one day, as if they'd gotten together and staged an intervention, I finally heard what everyone had been telling me all, all this time about my behavior. At last, the message got through. 
Start to gently ease back away from the blocks. Draw the knees closer in so you can bring the hands to your bench, your blocks. Return your way to hands and knees. Pick up one hand, circle the wrist, and then the other. Go to the other side, the wrist, wiggle the fingers. Come back into a child's pose. Sitting back on your heels, maybe a pillow on top of your heels. Maybe the knees together or apart, arms wrapped around you, or making a pillow for the head with the arms in front of you. When we're in denial, we can't hear anything that doesn't fit our fixed identity. Even something positive, you're kind, you did a great job, you have a wonderful sense of humor, is filtered through this fixed identity. You can't take it in unless it's already part of your self-definition. In Buddhism, that notion of fixed identity is called ego clinging. It's how we try to put solid ground under our feet in an ever-shifting world. We can do it with negativity. We can do it with positivity. But when it's fixed and unchanging, it's so at odds with what we know to be true about this ambiguity, this changing, this constant flux of life. This quarantine, meditation, yin yoga, this practice starts to erode your fixed identity, yeah? As you slow down, you begin to see yourself with more clarity, and you, noticed how, you notice how attached you are to your opinions about yourself. When things fall apart, as they did for Pema, you feel as if your whole world is crumbling, but actually it's your fixed identity that's crumbling. And Chogyam Trumpa says that that is cause for celebration. Because the purpose of this path is to unmask, to take off our armor. And when that happens, it feels like a crisis because it is. It's a fixed identity crisis. And the Buddha taught that the fixed identity is the cause of our suffering. Looking deeper, we could say that the real cause of suffering is not being able to tolerate uncertainty. Oh, yeah. And thinking that it's perfectly sane, perfectly normal to deny the fundamental groundlessness of being human. Hmm. Bring your way up to hands and knees. Moving into hip opening, starting with a dragon pose. So you may want to have a bench or blocks nearby. From hands and knees, you have a couple options. You could step the right foot forward, lean the left thigh down. Hands can be on blocks on either side of the foot. They could both be inside the foot. There's no reason to let that left knee be in pain if putting something underneath it would soften this. Feeling a stretch across the front of the left hip, maybe in the right outer hip. This is one of those places that the edge of a chair or a... Um, or the couch could work really well. I have to lean towards that support when I use the bench. And it's a big stretch in the front of the back thigh. Notice if your shoulders can soften. When your hands are on the blocks, your fingers can point to the front, to the side, to the back. They can be on any height. You can even have fists on the blocks. So think about the space in between your shoulder blades. Is that all tight? Could that relax down just a bit? Wiggle your toes, wiggle your fingers. Breathe in through your nose. Breathe out through your nose. Or maybe breathe in through your mouth and out through your mouth. What, what releases your suffering? Notice what's touching the ground or the support. Can you balance out weight between the right arm, the left arm, the right hand, the left hand, and the right foot on the ground? One more inhale here. One more exhale here. Moving into a shoelace or square pose from here. Press your hands into your blocks, your floor, your bench. And move the hips forward and backward a bit. So shoelace is coming to sit down with the knees on top of one another. 
we all get there in different ways. So for this, to stay consistent with the side, we'll have the right knee on top of the left knee. And again, it might not be shoelace in your body today. It might be more like crisscross applesauce with the right leg in front. If you love that fire log pose, if you love square pose, having the right shin on top of the left shin, that's great. Just notice that we're going to be here for a little while. So let the feet soften, unless flexing the feet allows the knee to feel comforted. So often we come into these shapes and we see a gap between this part and that part and we try to fill in that gap. I love putting something underneath that top hip thigh bone connection if this feels like something that you're clinging to hold. So blocks in front of you or your bench and your chair, leaning forward and down. Where do you feel the stretch across the back? across the hips, where even do the hips stop and the back begin? Do you feel the stretch going head to bottom or side to side? When we start to get curious and kind about asking these questions, we develop this really great relationship at the moment. We start to develop the ability to then ask questions about what don't I like about this? Why is this hard? Why is this unwanted? That has been eye-opening for me in my time during the day as a stay-at-home parent and homeschooler. So often things that we maybe weren't doing in our life, we might have thought we'd be pretty good at. And we might be finding out that we are, and that's sweet. And we might be finding out that we are not happy with it and comfortable with it. And that messes with our fixed ego identity. So do your very best to imagine what your thigh bones look like. And then imagine the muscles around them and give the muscles permission on your next exhale to relax the holding. The legs might not move at all, but when we move from the muscles holding the bone, the connective tissue gets a chance, an opportunity to stretch a little bit. Sometimes it welcomes that opportunity, and sometimes it says no thank you in a very loud, uncomfortable way. There's a quality of inviting a scared kitten out from under the couch in yin yoga. You soften. You let there be patience. Notice if your jaw is tight, if your teeth are touching one another, that might inform a softer way of holding the head or the arms here. The purpose of this spiritual path, Pema says, is to unmask, to take off our armor. And when that happens, it feels like a crisis because it is. It's a fixed identity crisis. And the Buddha taught us that the fixed identity is the cause of our suffering. Looking deeper, we could say that the real cause of suffering is not being able to tolerate uncertainty and thinking that it's perfectly sane, perfectly normal to deny the fundamental groundlessness of being. Ego clinging is our means of denial. Once we have the fixed idea, this is me, then we see everything as a threat or a promise or something we couldn't care less about. Whatever we encounter, whether we're attracted to it or averse to it or indifferent to it, depending on how much of a threat to our self-image <clears throat> it represents. The fixed identity is our false security. We maintain it by filtering all of our experience through this perspective. When we like someone, it's generally because they make us feel good. Ouch. They don't blow our trip. They don't disturb our fixed identity, so we're buddies. When we don't like someone, they're not on our wavelength, so we don't want to hang out with them. It's generally because they challenge our fixed identity. We're uncomfortable in their presence because they don't confirm us in the ways we want to be confirmed. So we can't function in the ways we want to function. 
often we think of the people we don't like as our enemies, but in fact, Pema says they're all important to us. They're our greatest teachers, special, mess special messengers who show up just when we need them to point out our fixed identity. Let's inhale together here. Exhale, sigh. Allow your head to rest as much as possible here. Your shoulders to be as round and gentle as possible. Some of your hands back beside you so you can feel the ground underneath your fingertips or your palms and press down there to lean back. Lifting the chest and then the head and releasing your legs long. Maybe you tuck the chin in and round forward. Maybe you want to lean back and move the legs side to side. Sometimes with the legs over top of one another, the groins get a real deep, a real deep hug there and it can feel good to release them. Hmm. And then make your way back up to your hands and knees. Step the left foot forward, coming into dragon pose on this side. Hmm. Sometimes it's useful to ask why when we find this sense of what we don't like or something that's uncomfortable. That's been useful for me. Maybe, maybe that could be good in your toolbox. Why don't I like this right now? Whatever this is. Because beneath that is, a, is, a, is another thing, is words about fear or insecurity. And, and when we find the words, the understanding, the description of the fear, we then, can, we then can ask for help about it. We can be gentle with ourselves and, and know that there are things that are going to trigger our fear or anxiety. Maybe, maybe we find our freedom from suffering in dialing down the intensity of the sensation or the need for it to be different. Maybe you feel this when you do your shopping or... Some of us feel it when we see movies with people congregating everywhere. Find your right side and your left side and your hands and your arms and see if you can even things out there. Know that what happened on one side in Dragon Pose might not work on the other side. The discomfort associated with groundlessness, with the fundamental ambiguity of being human, comes from our, our attachment to wanting things to be a certain way. And the Tibetan word for attachment is shenpa. Emma says, my teacher, Zigar Kongtrul, calls shenpa the barometer of ego clinging, a gauge of our self-involvement and self-importance. Shenpa has a visceral quality associated with the grasping or conversely the pushing away. It's the feeling of I like, I want, I need, and the feeling of I don't like, I don't want, I want it to go away. Pema says, I think of Shempa as being hooked. It's the stuck feeling that tightening or closing down or withdrawing that we experience when we're uncomfortable with what's going on. Shenpa is also the urge to find relief from those feelings by clinging to something that gives us pleasure. See so if you can relax your jaw, the space in between your shoulders, whether your shoulder blades are squeezing together or softening down for one more long inhale. And exhale. Notice if you can't wait for this to end or you'd like it to go on longer, make space for that and then press into the hands, ease the hips back and forth. Making your way into a shoelace or square pose here. Knowing that if your knees say no thank you, that one of the smartest things you can do is say okay and explore. Explore supporting the thigh bones or the hips or the seat up or in a tilted way. You can also with this, so now it's the left leg that's on top or in front. Sometimes we look at the space in between the thigh here. You could also bring a block or something underneath this left foot to allow that left thigh muscle to relax from the holding. Mm. 
Sometimes it's when the knees are um, tightly closed in that sense of so the front of the knee is actually open, but when the back of the knee is tightly closed, that can sometimes be uncomfortable. I love putting a sock or an eye pillow or something in the back of my knee for a little space. Maybe you have something under the arms so the shoulders relax. Maybe you have something under the arms and the head here to relax. This is one of those shapes that we could, we could keep working on. We could keep doing, we could keep perfecting this and that. And we also have the choice to let this be enough. Let this be okay. The uncomfortableness, the uncertainty. Let that, of course, not be your truth if your jaw is tight, if this feels like pain. Often the biggest sensation in this shape is around the hips and the low back. So what if we came to this with the understanding that those areas are doing their very best and instead we Notice the jaw on this exhale. And notice the wrists on this exhale. Notice the front belly so soft on this exhale. Space for breath and digestion. Oh, the belly does so much. Shenpa is the urge to find relief from feelings by clinging to anything that gives us pleasure. Anything can trigger our clinging, our attachments. Someone criticizes our work or looks at us the wrong way. My husband totally did that this morning. The dog chews our favorite shoes. We spill on our best tie. One minute we're feeling fine, then something happens. And suddenly we're hooked into anger, jealousy, blame, recrimination, or self-doubt. This discomfort, this sense of being triggered because things are not quote unquote right, because we want them to last longer or go away. This is the felt experience, the visceral experience of the fundamental ambiguity of being human. For the most part, our attachment, our shenpa arises involuntarily, our, habit our habitual response to feeling insecure. When we're hooked, we turn to anything to relieve the discomfort. But there's something more fruitful we can do when that edgy feeling arrives. It's similar to the way we can deal with pain. Our po one popular way of relating to pain, physical pain, is a mindfulness meditation. It involves directing your full attention to the pain, breathing in and out of the spot that hurts. Instead of trying to avoid the discomfort, you open yourself completely to it. You become receptive to the painful sensation without dwelling on the story. The mind wants to tell you, it's bad, I shouldn't feel this way, maybe it'll move or go away. This is the practice that's the opposite of whatever. Because when you contact the all worked up feeling of Shenpa, the basic instruction is the same as dealing with physical pain. Whether it's a feeling of I like or I don't like, or an emotional state like loneliness, depression, or anxiety. You open yourself fully to the sensation, free of interpretation. Maybe you try it with physical pain first to find out this experience for yourself. It can be quite miraculous. When you give your full attention to what's uncomfortable here, and drop the good or bad, right or wrong story, and simply experience the discomfort for even a short time. It's possible for your ideas about the pain, the discomfort, the not liking, to ease or dissolve.
And just a few more breaths here in the shoelace or square pose or crisscross applesauce. Sometimes hearing that is the relief you needed to soften into being uncomfortable. A different quality of the softening when we transition and release. The softening into being uncomfortable reminds us of how strong and wise and kind we are. And that sometimes the part of us that is worried or anxious we can be made to relax by a little bit of letting go. Let's inhale here and sigh. I'm pressing your hands down into something to gently roll up from the bottom to the top, releasing the legs long, releasing the feet to the floor with the knees bent. I'd like to invite, invite you to move into a restorative child's pose next. So you practice child's pose already where your belly was touching your thighs, your weight of your torso was on your own legs. The really important quality of a restorative child's pose is that the weight of your head and your shoulders and your torso goes onto something else. So you could place a block and bolsters in front of you. You can make a tower of blankets and pillows. You generally come into this shape by sitting back on the heels, if that's comfortable in your body today. It's definitely going to rain sometime soon. I can feel it. So I'm going to sit on a pillow. This actually, the pillow works can work better for me sometimes than what we use in the studio, the yoga blanket, because it goes all the length of my shin. So there's something in between the back of my knees. And I'm gonna bring this support that I've created all the way up so it touches my thighs. That touching of my thighs I think is really important because it lets my body know there's something there. And then I'm gonna lean forward until I actually feel my bottom lift up. So this has to be high enough so that my bottom lifts up because that means more of the weight of my torso is now here. With all these layers, you might, you might find hugging here, nice underneath. You might have blocks if there's extras around underneath your wrists. And if you think you have all the weight you can on this support, then lean forward even a little more. Right? Don't settle for okay. So I like having the top of my head not touch something. I have a sensitive head. You might like something the whole way here. You might love having your chin tucked in. You might like looking to one side. I think one of the really cool things about a practice of restorative yoga is that you move into the just because I can doesn't mean I should version of the shape. Just because my hands can touch the ground, what would happen if I had a blanket or something lightly underneath so my elbows were softer, so the muscles and connective tissue across my shoulder and my back weren't stretched out all the way to reach the ground. So much of your lung um, tissue is in the back of the body. Cuddling up this soft belly, this place where breath pushes out and pulls back in, can allow you to connect with what's happening in the back body of that lifting and expanding.
sometimes we read about these practices of welcoming the ambiguity and they feel like a delicious invitation we're interested in. And sometimes they feel way too much to take on right here and right now. Because staying present and moving into or forward or deeper in the feeling feels, feels like too much. Maybe you've heard about um, this brain scientist, Jill Boat Taylor, had a stroke and wrote this really cool book about it called My Stroke of Insight. And it was her recovery that she charts from this massive stroke. And she explained in the book, and Pema quotes it here, the physiological mechanism behind emotion. Because we're talking about feeling, not just sensation, but feeling. An emotion like anger that's an automatic response lasts just 90 seconds from the moment it's triggered until it runs its course. One and one half minute, that's all. When it lasts longer, which it usually does, it's because we've made choices in that 90 seconds to rekindle it. The fact of the shifting, changing nature of our emotions is something we could take advantage of, but do we? It's hard, really hard. So maybe something that might have only lasted one and one half minutes gets drawn out for minutes or hours or years. That's what happens when we keep that fixed ego identity. identity. We keep recycling the storyline. We keep strengthening old habits. Most of us have physical or mental conditions that have caused us to stress in the past. That's part of our human condition. And when we get a whiff of one coming, uh, an, an, uh, an asthma attack coming on, a symptom of chronic fatigue, a twinge of anxiety, it's so natural to panic. Instead of relaxing with the feeling and let it do its minute and a half while we're fully open and receptive to it, we say, oh no, oh no, here it is again. We refuse to feel the fundamental ambiguity when it comes in this form, so we do the one thing that will be most detrimental to us. We rev up our thoughts about it. What if this happens? What if that happens? We stir up a lot of mental activity. We can counter this response by training and being present, by doing the one and a half minute thing. So when you feel that thing coming on, that anxiety, that anger, that fear, one way to deal with that edgy, queasy feeling is to do the one and a half minute thing, to acknowledge the feeling and give it your full, compassionate, even welcoming attention, even if it's only for just a few seconds. Drop the storyline about the feeling. This allows you to have a direct experience of it, free of interpretation. Don't fuel it with concepts or opinions about whether it's good or bad. Be present with the sensation. Where is it located in your body? Is it the exact same now? Or now, does it shift and change? Just a few more breaths in this supply the child's pose. And draw your chin back in line with the midline of the body and start to slide your elbows back so your hands press into something. 
And gently press yourself back up and away from what you're sitting upon. Use your hands to gently move that forward. Lift your hips up so you kind of come to hands and knees. If there was something behind you, bring that away. And then sit down onto your bottom and release your legs long. And so the restorative child's pose is, is inviting the front body forward and the back body to expand. I'm going to invite you to come into a kind of restorative legs up the wall. So you've created this delicious platform for your belly to rest down on. You could lay on your back beside it or in front of it so that your calves are completely supported by this. If you would rather use a couch, a bench, a chair, you're welcome to do that as well. See about bringing a pillow or a blanket for your head. So coming into this shape, you sit down in front of what you're going to bring your legs up to, and you bring your legs there. So it might be a blanket that comes under you. If you're using a pile of pillows um, and blankets, there's a sweet quality that it might actually move away from you or you can snuggle it in. Maybe it's the exact length of your calves. Sometimes using a chair or a couch or a bench, there's kind of a hanging off quality. So maybe you want to put on socks here. So a pillow is delightful, especially if it's a nice soft pillow. A blanket has the added quality of being able to come across your shoulders as well. So having just the right amount of curve under your neck, the outer edges can come forward. And since this isn't being recorded for any YouTube thing later, you can have such a mismatch of stuff. It might be if this blanket is a little uneven that there's, you bring something else over. Maybe you bring something over to protect your soft belly, to gently press down so you feel connected to the earth. Allowing yourself to lie back and down. Maybe something gently across the belly here. And draw a long, slow breath in and sigh. <sighs> I've had the pleasure of studying with Jillian Pransky. She is a restorative yoga teacher of teachers. And these are the words she wrote last week to invite people to a practice. The less freely we breathe, she wrote, the more anxious and the less present, separate and disconnected we feel. The good news. Mindful breathing can break that loop. It's the fastest, most efficient way to draw ourselves out of the cycle of anxiety. It tells our nervous system that we're safe. And into a state where we feel more calm and connected. When we slow down our breath and become present, it's like we're recharging ourselves. Getting grounded and becoming present our practices we do in tandem. We practice feeling our body land on the earth. And then we practice paying attention to the single thing that can unfailingly anchor us into the present moment, our breath. The breath is something we allow. Breathing is not an activity. 
It's not something we need to accomplish. It's a process that we allow to happen. The breath is simply waiting for more room so that it can fill us. We can begin to see how our breath is our partner, always there for us without question. Similar to the way we learn to rely on the support of the ground, becoming aware of our partnership with the breath reinforces our experience of connectedness, of not feeling alone. We will be triggered. Shen Pa will happen. We will come in contact with this groundlessness and moral ambiguity of life. Sometimes it will feel as if there's no solid ground to support us. Each time we could choose to pause and replace our attention on our breath maybe for 90 seconds. We welcome our mind home to our body. Each time we replace our attention on our breath, we find that being grounded is an ability we have in this moment. And again in this moment. We find the inhale and the exhale. We welcome it in and out. Notice if any quality of holding yourself to rest arises. As the shape and our experience of it are in flux, allow yourself to shift. Invite awareness that this doesn't work for you today. That is the experience you are having. You feel the contact of the hair on your head with what is underneath your head. You 
can feel the space along the spine, the middle of the back that might not be touching the ground. And imagine welcoming those muscles to soften closer to what is underneath you. You feel how the ground always welcomes the low back and the seat and the hips and the thighs spreading out. You know how much of our body is made up of liquid. Maybe imagine the edges of you gently, softly melting to spread out and down for just a few more moments here. And if you're using a chair, start to bring your knees in and maybe the heels come to the chair, maybe the arches of the feet come to the edge of the chair. If you're on a pile of pillows and blankets or bolsters and blocks, start to wiggle your thighs in towards your belly. Reach your arms out wide. Give yourself a hug. Mm. So one of your arms is on top. Reach your fingertips to the ceiling. Give yourself a hug with the other arm on top. And then gently, you might have to edge the chair away from your bottom, or maybe you have enough space where you are to roll over onto your side. Going all the way down, thigh touching thigh, both arms in front of your chest. Pressing your hands down, come to set yourself up for Shavasana. So maybe that pillow or the blanket that was just under your head stays right where it is or moves to a different place based on how your space is set up for you today. The height of the blankets and pillows that were underneath your legs might come down considerably. At least by half would be my guess. You could still certainly have that underneath the back of the thighs. It can be really nice sometimes to kind of hook the legs over so that this support hits the back of the thighs and then the leaning back and down can still feel like the legs are lifted, but they're, they're really extended long. Maybe a blanket, just resting across the hips, maybe just resting across the shoulders. On days when I feel really uncomfortable with my shanda, I like to have blocks beside me. And then I reach my arms in front of me so my palms face. And then I take my hands over the other so my thumbs point down and interlace my fingers. Then I draw my knuckles down to my belly, up to my chest, and rest my elbows, the back of my arms, on these blocks. Some days I can't remember how to do the wrist thing, and I have one hand on top of the other, on top of my heart, or on top of my chest and my belly to feel the movement of my breath. Letting the legs relax side to side. Drawing a long, slow breath in through your nose. Exhale to sigh.
Acknowledge what you're feeling. And give it your full, compassionate, even welcoming attention. And drop any story behind that feeling. Be present with the sensation. Notice the rise and fall of your breath. Invite yourself to lean back and feel held by the earth, by your decision to come to practice today. Hear the noises around you and exhale. And feel the contact you make with the blankets, the clothes, and the ground as you inhale. And give yourself permission to melt to float, to breathe. To arrive here, and to arrive now. Let's all breathe in together and sigh. And begin to make small movements in your hands and your feet. Maybe you've interlaced the arms over your chest. You might want to reach. If it feels good, take a big stretch. As you're ready, roll over onto your right side and give, you, give yourself a hug. Thank yourself for coming to your mat. I believe that yoga puts us back in contact with the parts of us that we've lost touch with. It's great for the physical body. It's magic for the heart and the soul. 
Thank you for practicing. Make your way up to come to sit on a chair, on the ground, legs long, knees bent, anything you choose. Hmm. And gather your hands together in front of your heart, either one on top of the other or palm touching palm. Lift your heart and bow your head, soften your elbows. Let's join our voices to chant the sound of Om once and begin the rest of our day chanting Shanti three times together. Together we inhale. Ah, Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Lift your face, bring your thumbs to the space between your eyebrows, trust your intuition, bow forward to you, seal in your practice. Loka samasta suki no pavantu. May all beings everywhere be happy and free. Namaste.